On Memorial Day 2001, Henry Kissinger was vacationing at the Ritz Hotel in Paris. Up until the moment when French police handed him a warrant, I'm sure Mr. Kissinger had been a big man around the hotel, and indeed a big man around Paris, because seldom do people ask, how did you get your money and become so famous? Most people are just admiring of the rich and famous no matter how it came to be. But on this one day in 2001, just months before September 11th, Henry Kissinger had to flee town in the middle of the night like a bandit sensing the need to get out of Dodge. The police served Kissinger with a warrant requesting his testimony in the matter of disappeared French citizens in Pinochet's Chile. Kissinger has since been summoned as a witness by senior magistrates in Chile and Argentina who are investigating the international terrorist network that went under the name Operation Condor and that conducted assassinations, kidnappings, and bombings in several countries, including right here in the United States. Moreover, on September 10, 2001, a civil suit was filed in Washington, D.C. federal court charging Kissinger with murder. The suit brought by the survivors of General Rene Schneider of Chile asserts that Kissinger gave the order for the elimination of this constitutional officer of a democratic country because he refused to endorse plans for a military coup. Every single document in the prosecution's case is a U.S. government declassified memo. The very next day, September 11th, we all know what happened. Or rather, we know what we saw and the implications for the world and for us inside this country have been enormous. On January 21, 2005, for policies emanating from the Pentagon while under his watch, U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld canceled a planned trip to Munich because the Center for Constitutional Rights and four Iraqis tortured while in U.S. custody at Abu Ghraib filed a complaint with German authorities against Rumsfeld former CIA Director George Tenet, and eight other U.S. civilian and military leaders for abuses at Abu Ghraib and other locations around Iraq. Imagine Henry Kissinger, Donald Rumsfeld, ducking international warrants for their arrest, George W. Bush, Condoleezza Rice, Alberto Gonzalez, Dick Cheney, the whole lot of them deserve no respite on their run for justice. They should find no safe harbor in any spot on this planet. But they are not the only ones guilty and to whom justice must be meted out. As a matter of policy, the United States government has routinely done to the poor and people of color abroad what it has done to the poor and people of color here at home. Our tax dollars are used routinely to overthrow elected governments and to support heinous dictatorships like in Indonesia, South Korea, Argentina, Chile, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Congo, Congo and to prolong white rule over Africa. In addition to the slave trade that depleted the African continent of its most precious resource, us, human beings, Africa continues to suffer in quite extraordinary ways, perpetrated by outsiders. The Pan-African News Agency reported on an alleged plan by the U.S. and other European countries to dump 29 million tons of toxic waste in 11 African countries. The materials to be dumped included industrial and chemical waste, pesticide sludge, radioactive waste, as well as other hazardous wastes. Professor Thomas Nagy uncovered a document on the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency website that discusses how allied forces could block efforts to purify contaminated water 
leading to the full degradation of the Iraqi water treatment system within six months. I've read that document. Seems the U.S. planners didn't care that attacking the Iraqi public water supply flagrantly targets civilians and is a violation of the Geneva Convention and of the fundamental laws of civilized nations. In contravention of even our own laws, U.S. weapons are used around the world in human rights abuses. Israel regularly uses U.S.-built F-16 warplanes against Palestinian targets. However, the actions launched against Henry Kissinger and Donald Rumsfeld and others suggest that other countries are reticent to tolerate the failure of the United States to respect human rights in its actions abroad. Spain recently indicted 40 members of the U.S. proxy Paul Kagame's Rwandan army for genocide, an action I was involved in bringing about. In this litigation, we are also attempting to hold U.S. corporations accountable for their participation in human rights abuses in Congo, as Chevron is being held accountable for the murders of Nigerians struggling to eke out a living under massive abuses by corporations exploiting Nigeria's oil. But we must also make it clear that human rights is not only about foreign policy. In the wake of Rodney King, Abner Louima, Amadou Diallo, Timothy Thomas, Terence Shern, Katherine Johnston, and Sean Bell, in the wake of COINTELPRO, Wounded Knee, and MOVE, we must make it clear that human rights is about domestic policy too. Not too many weeks ago, I submitted a statement with the help of Dr. Jared Ball to the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance on the sad, long trail of human rights abuses in this country's legal system that blacks have had to endure. Human rights abusers, abuses are against the law. And I would suggest to you that the United States is a serial human rights abuser. In 1947, at the dawn of the United Nations Organization, and just after the horrifying 1946 lynching of four Georgians, including black veterans and even a pregnant woman, W.E.B. Du Bois and the NAACP submitted its petition on behalf of Negroes to the United Nations Human Rights Commission. And then in 1951, Paul Robeson and, the Will and William Patterson returned to the UN with the first call for reparations entitled we charge genocide, demanding compensatory damages for the slave trade. In fact, between 1946 and 1951, the United Nations was presented with complaints on behalf of blacks in the United States three times. Du Bois's efforts to present the petition to the United Nations were thwarted by none other than Eleanor Roosevelt, who along with the NAACP leadership didn't want to harm the Democrats' chances to win the White House if the issue of the treatment of blacks in the United States was debated at the UN. Eventually, as we all know, Du Bois was expelled from the NAACP. Du Bois did sign the Robeson and Patterson UN filing along with family members of lynching victims and those murdered in state-sanctioned executions based on false charges. Robeson's petition concluded that the oppressed Negro citizens of the United States, segregated, discriminated against, and long the target of violence, suffer from genocide as the result of the consistent, conscious, unified policies of every branch of the government. Interestingly, just as the presidential elections derailed Du Bois's efforts to gain attention from the UN General Assembly, politics of the Cold War amid US pressure swept Robeson's call off the world body's agenda. In 1965, Malcolm X was planning to follow in Du Bois's and Robeson's footsteps by taking documented human rights abuses and a charge of genocide against the United States before the UN. 
As we all know, Malcolm X was murdered before he had the opportunity to complete this mission. In 1967, in response to approximately 150 uprisings in this country, the United States government called on a national commission to conduct a study to determine the cause and how to prevent it from continuing. The resulting report is popularly known as the Kerner Report, which stated that the cause of these uprisings and disturbances was white racism. The findings of this report formed the basis and the rationale for the operations of the counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO. In the FBI's own words, its counterintelligence program, then known as COINTELPRO, had as a goal, quote, to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize, unquote, the activities of black organizations, and to prevent black leaders from gaining resp resp respectability. Journalists and publications went along with the program and knowingly lied to their subscribers and patrons in order to discredit certain black leaders and deny them black and white support. The activities carried out under the banner of COINTELPRO were deemed by Senator Frank Church to be illegal and un-American. A review of the government's documents reveals that among its tactics were sneak and peek home and office invasions, false arrests, including imprisonments based on false charges, disruption of marriages, stoking intra and inter-organizational rivalries, violence, and even murder. In fact, I am proud to have followed in the footsteps of both Du Bois and Robeson. As chair of the Congressional Black Caucus World Conference Against Racism Task Force in 2001, I commissioned a paper written by Kathleen Cleaver and Paul Wolf, outlining the murders of Black Panther Party members stoked by the FBI's counterintelligence program. I proudly gave that paper to then United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson. I explained to her that gross crimes had consistently been committed against black people in the United States and that those crimes included not only the U.S. version of apartheid, but also lack of self-determination and even murder for those struggling to change it. One can survey the various reports issued by organizations dedicated to the elimination of racial discrimination and its vestiges in our country. What they all tell us is that this country has a very long way to go before racial disparities are eliminated. Without a public policy intervention, 200 years, according to a Hull House report, to close the quality of life gap between blacks and whites in Chicago, over 5,000 years to close the home ownership gap between blacks and whites now that the predatory lending mortgage crisis has gripped families across our country, resulting in the greatest loss of wealth for blacks in modern history, according to United for a Fair Economy. No wonder in May of 2001, just months before our attention was riveted on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the United States got thrown off the United Nations Human Rights Commission. Our Department of Justice admits that blacks are more likely than whites to be pulled over by police, imprisoned, and put to death. And though blacks and whites have about the same rate of drug use, blacks are more likely to be arrested than whites and are more likely to receive longer prison sentences than whites. Government studies on health disparities confirm that blacks are less likely to receive surgery, transplants, and prescription drugs than whites. Physicians are less likely to prescribe appropriate treatment for blacks than for whites, and black scientists, physicians, and institutions are shut out of the funding stream to prevent or change this. Racial disparities in infant mortality are worse today than at the time of the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Among other things, 
Hurricane Katrina exposed how the United States government still allows blacks to live and die. The objective of COINTELPRO was to keep the descendants of slaves ignorant, impoverished, divided, and powerless, unable to utilize political power and public policy to improve their objective conditions. From the COINTELPRO documents, we learn that as early as October 1919, J. Edgar Hoover was concerned about authentic black leaders who, quote, excited the Negroes. Those are his words, not mine. He goes on to lament the fact that Marcus Garvey had done nothing deportable and that Garvey was a threat because he excited the Negroes. Marcus Garvey was first noticed by the United States government and then targeted by it so that Garvey could never influence U.S. policies. Du Bois and Robeson were first noticed and then targeted by the United States government so they could never influence U.S. politics. Malcolm X and members of the Nation of Islam were targeted by the United States government so they could never influence U.S. politics. And the story is revealed in the government's own papers. In fact, Malcolm was murdered just as he was planning to submit documentation of human rights abuses and acts of genocide to the UN. Members of SCLC, Dr. King's organization, and Dr. King himself were targeted by our government. Members of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, were targeted by our government. U.S. documents reveal that military intelligence spied on black leaders before World War II up to the assassinations of Malcolm X and Dr. King and since including political rappers and community organizers. In 1968, one month before the murder of Dr. King, the FBI spelled out its mission in this COINTELPRO program. When certain actors decide to select the leadership for blacks rather than allowing them to select their own leaders, that is a denial of self-determination. Rolling back enforcement provisions of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, as has been done by successive Supreme Court decisions, is a denial of self-determination. Failing to make political representation meaningful is a denial of self-determination. Meaningful political representation presses for policy results that address the, the statistics of disparity that plague just about every aspect of black life in this country. COINTELPRO's architects wrote that they wanted to deny black nationalist leaders any sympathy from whites, and they targeted our youth so that young blacks would never adhere to a black nationalist ideology. That was point number five on the original founding document of the COINTELPRO operation, and I believe is the underlying rationale of the law enforcement surveillance that accompanies potentially political cultural icons, including today's young hip hop artists. Why shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised then that the media complex promote 50 Cent, but refuse to play the conscious music of Dead Prez, Nappy Roots, Talib Kweli, Most Deaf, Immortal Technique, and others. The cumulative effect of all of this is that self-determination is being denied to the descendants of slaves inside this country. Not only that, it's genocide. The elimination in whole or in part of a people, including their culture. Robeson was right, and I too charge genocide. And in the context of the United States, Native Americans are also victims of genocide. In his last public address, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. exclaimed that he was glad to be living at the end of the 20th century. He said, quote, something is happening in our world that men and women are demanding to be free. At the dawn of the 21st century, I too can say, something is happening in our world. 
The world's marginalized, exploited, and dispossessed have decided to defy imperial domination. Our struggle in the United States is to join with the valiant people of Venezuela, Cote d'Ivoire, Argentina, Spain, India, Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, Nicaragua, and Haiti, who defied all the odds and voted through the instrument of their vote to take their countries back. In the 1960s, an idealistic young Berkeley, California student admonished the young activists of his day to put their entire bodies against the gears and the levers and the wheels of the machine and say to the owners, if you don't stop it, we will stop your machine. The people of those countries stopped the machine. And my Power to the People campaign is trying to do that work here. I need your help. Please join me, support me, volunteer, and donate, and then vote for me. I look forward to the day when it's not only Henry Kissinger and Donald Rumsfeld who are scurrying away from the disinfectant of the truth. I look forward to the day when all the oppressed peoples of this world, including us here in this country, victimized by fancy-sounding economic policies, political ideologies, and crushing state-sponsored violence, can serve arrest warrants on the men and women who make these criminal policies and then get to live out their lives in plush hotels with private protection. I look forward to the day when justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Investigating the international terrorist network that went under the name Operation Condor and that conducted assassinations, kidnappings, and bombings in several countries, including right here in the United States. Moreover, on September 10, 2001, a civil suit was filed in Washington, D.C. federal court charging Kissinger with murder. The suit brought by the survivors of General Rene Schneider of Chile, asserts that Kissinger gave the order for the elimination of this constitutional officer of a democratic country because he refused to endorse plans for a military coup. Every single document in the prosecution's case is a U.S. government. On Memorial Day 2001, Henry Kissinger was vacationing at the Ritz Hotel in Paris. Up until the moment when French police handed him a warrant, I'm sure Mr. Kissinger had been a big man around the hotel, and indeed a big man around Paris, because seldom do people ask, how did you get your money and become so famous? Most people are just admiring of the rich and famous no matter how it came to be. But on this one day in 2001, just months before September 11th, Henry Kissinger had to flee town in the middle of the night like a bandit sensing the need to get out of Dodge. The police served Kissinger with a warrant requesting his testimony in the matter of disappeared French citizens in Pinochet's Chile. Kissinger has since been summoned as a witness by senior magistrates in Chile and Argentina who are investigating